This is, this is number four in our, in our kind of uh, looking at uh, the love of God in Song of Songs. So we're going to read, gonna read from chapter six this week. Uh, and if you've got one of these kind of lilac Bibles, Bibles, um, it's, um, it's on page 684 is the, is the section that I'm going to be reading on, 684. Um, and it's Song of Songs chapter six. And we're going to be looking at verses um, just four to nine four to nine um, of Song of Songs, chapter six. So, Song of Songs, chapter six, verse four says this, you are beautiful as Terzar, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem, as majestic as troops with banners. Turn your eyes from me, they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is missing. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Sixty queens there may be and eighty concubines and virgins beyond number, but my dove, my perfect one is unique the only daughter of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines praised her. Um, some of us were at a wedding on, on Friday uh, afternoon. We were at Carly's wedding. Carly had been working alongside us through the last year. And it's always be good when you go to a wedding to listen to people saying their wedding vows. And it's kind of uh, humbling to hear people who are willing to make kind of serious, stark promises to one another. And, and I always love it, particularly when um, you're a, a, a wedding where the vows are... Um, uh, vows that have been kind of formulated out of a well, a kind of Christian Church of England wedding, and 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 those vows are said because they're serious, and you know they're made before God, and you know they are an expression of God's design for marriage, and uh, and it's a significant thing. You're aware that you're there's something transcendent going on that people are not just. Um, entering into a marriage contract. This is a, a covenantal thing. And in our culture, that's, I think, increasingly rare to sort of see that. And it, and it does have a kind of a beauty and a depth to it that you don't see everywhere. I know that when you go down to the um, registry office for, for a wedding there and you hear people kind of say vows that they've written and then, uh, and then they sign the document and, and it just there's, there's something about it that feels lacking in, in substance to some degree. In the book of Song of Songs, it is a love song. It is like people who've written their own vows and kind of like uh, it's gushy and sort of heart, from, from the heart. It's meant to be. Um, but as we come to the end of this little series, I want to start by asking a couple of questions that might still bother us. Okay. And the first question is this. How do we know that this book has something to say about us and the church? Why? Has the church seen it like this over so many centuries? Why are we sure that this has anything to say about Jesus? Is it just that the church has some problem with sex and therefore we just, we can't read it as it's meant to be written and we have to sort of um, sentimentalize it and spiritualize it and that sort of thing? Um, and I was going to mention Julian's book at this point, but I'm going to do it again. He, he has a chapter looking at some of the reasons why uh, the church has kind of pointed this forward to say this is about more than just um, um, a marriage. This is about our relationship with Christ. One of the reasons is a more general reason that just sits across the whole Bible that he gives, that, that, that marriage is regularly seen as a way that God relates to his people. We see it really strongly in the New Testament, in place like Ephesians 5, but it's across the whole of the Old Testament too. And particularly, God is pictured as a bridegroom to his people, and, and the, the image is quite unflattering one about people because, well, it's about Israel described as an unfaithful wife running into the arms of, of other lovers. And uh, that's kind of a common image across the whole of the Old Testament. So when, we're, when we've got this book that is strongly about marriage, there ought to be some kind of things that, that go on in our head about, about what this is about. But there's some more specific reasons from within the book itself. 
I think we've said often that the couple at the center of it are, it's, their love is kind of hyper real. It's, it's, it's significant. It's an idealized vision of the couple. It goes way beyond the expectations of just one couple. This is not just kind of a, an image to say, pursue love like it's like this. It's sort of knowingly self-referential that this is an unreal image of, of marriage. Even in the title of the book, Song of Songs, it's the song to end all other love songs. It's kind of bigger than big. It's kind of a, a hyper-realized thing. Or the imagery of the book, there's so much, for a book about love and poetry about love, there's so much geography in the book, which, you know, geography and, and love songs don't necessarily go together, but it's all about the land. And it's actually, as you go through the different songs, you're traveling around different parts of Israel and the different places that are mentioned, the mountains and the fields and the cities and, and so on. And it's almost like people would be reading it thinking, oh, that's my bit, or that's where I live, or things like that, that's where I'm from. And it's a love story that's, I think, designed to wrap everybody up in it. Uh, is the whole nation of Israel, it's supposed to wrap them all up in it. And it's also this sort of strange thing. It, at some points, it sounds like it's a royal wedding. At other points, you get a strong sense this is about two um, farm laborers who are in love. And again, so just the whole thing about who, who is it all about? Who's at the center? It's, it's, it's a bigger thing than just kind of Solomon's wedding. It points way beyond itself to something bigger. But I want us to think about a second question, not just... How do we know this has got something to say about Jesus? But secondly, why is this in our Bibles? And that might be because I think it might be a, a difficult thing to answer in terms of why is it here? Because we find Song of Songs a bit uncomfortable and mushy. Think some of the things that you've even been picking up from just what Anna and Catherine have said so far, that in this in the difficulty that we have to grasp God's love for us and see God's love in very concrete terms, maybe we just struggle because we're used to sort of seeing things in, in very analytical ways. And, and part of why we've got Song of Songs written for us is so that we actually have love poetry to communicate the depth of God's love for us in a deep and significant way. I wonder whether this is just hard for us because we live at the start of the 21st century. We live after the age of the Enlightenment, the great scientific age of discoveries and technologies that says if you want to know what is really true, you, you find things that are rational. That's the foundational fabric. That's the unmovable point of reality. How do I know something is true? It's because I can scientifically study it and take it apart and see it from the inside. And so we approach the Bible a bit like that. If I want to know that God loves me, I kind of pull up different parts of away from each other and kind of look at them and study them and, and kind of look at the cross and, and see God's love in, in, in analytical terms. But the problem is that so often we hit things that science just doesn't give us a language to explain, like love. Maybe we struggle with the language of poetry. In truth, we just don't see the point of it. Yet it tells us, it gives us a language. And maybe we just struggle with that. With No, just tell me the idea, give it to me in analytical ways, and I don't need the illustrations, thank you. Just give it to me cold. And we're not ready for Song of Songs. But I just wonder as, as that Enlightenment age kind of you know, shifts and we're moving away from that into something else, something else is emerging. And, and maybe Song of Songs says something deep and significant for our culture and for us. Maybe we're not ready for in terms of how God's love, how deep it really is. And not just in a sentimental way, but in a profoundly comforting way. So let me, let me take you to, to a different part of the Bible, just momentarily. Okay, there's a verse in Zeph Zephaniah 3. I've never preached. We've never looked at Zephaniah as far as I can remember. But this verse has stayed with me for a long time. And it, it, the verse says something that deeply gets, uh, just profoundly gets under my skin. It's in a section of Zephaniah where God is talking about Israel's distress and despair. And then suddenly the whole chapter changes and it talks about a day when God is going to come and, and really comfort his people. And it's, it becomes kind of thoroughly messianic. It starts talking about Jesus in a really unexpected way. And then you have this verse, which is, I think, it's, I, 
There is a profundity to it. I'll just read it for you. You don't need to look it up. Spend the whole of the rest of the sermon trying to find Zephaniah in your Bible, and that won't help. So let me just read it for us. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his, in his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. He will rejoice over you with singing. And I, I, there are verses like this one across, across the Bible. And I was just thinking at one point how profound that verse really is to think of God singing over his people. Just at one point, I had this mad idea of doing four sermons just on that one verse. But then I thought, no, well, let's go to Song of Songs. So we'll sort of hear, we'll listen into the song, I think. Because I think what that verse is saying, God is overwhelming his people with a sense of his love. Not just to say analytically, I want you to understand in your heads that I love you. But I want you to feel it in your hearts. And so I think the question I have is, if God sings over his people, what does he sing? What does he sing over his people today? Now, you might think all this stuff is a bit mushy and wet and whatnot. We just need to read our Bibles. But I think, well, I think this is what we have Song of Songs for. I think this is what God sings over his people. And if you want to know what Song of Songs 6 is all about, where we're going... I think there is just one main idea that God celebrates over his church, that God sings with delight over the harmony of his people. God sings with delight over the harmony, about the harmony of his people. I think that's what chapter six is all about. And the reasons that um, I think it's about that is there, there are two sections of Song of Songs where you just have these really awkward lists of descriptions where they are people singing about what they most appreciate about each other. Okay? And it, is, it is awkward. It's, it's listening to people giving their vows that they've written themselves. It's, just, it's, the, it's, the most, it's almost the most awkward part of Song of Songs. The actual most awkward part of Song of Songs is chapter 5, okay? that, which is the real kind of most intimate part of the book. But chapter 4 and chapter 6 are these kind of real intimate bookends around the center where they are celebrations of beauty. Now, if you want to know what this sounds like, I think you've got to think Bruno Mars. I give you a little picture of Bruno Mars here. Okay, Bruno Mars song, Just the Way You Are. Oh, her eyes, her eyes make the stars look like they're not shining. Her hair, her hair falls perfectly without her trying. She's so beautiful, and I tell her every day. You know, it's Bruno Mars is Song of Songs 4 and 6, okay? It's the, uh, or, um, or if you want to get even more awkward, it's Shape of You by Ed Sheeran. Okay, I'm not quoting that. Or You're Beautiful by James Blunt, which is kind of that creepy stalker song, okay? It's like really, yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's really awkward, isn't it, listening to people describing each other. And it's particularly awkward in Song of Songs because you've got to do some cultural translation. If you put up the image, this is why the imagery is is kind of difficult because um, people, various people have put together what it looks like if you take all the images and say, what does this woman look like that he's describing? Hair of goats and, you know, teeth sheep and, you know, the associations we we just struggle with. But let's try and pick it through a little bit just to see what's what's going on and he starts with and again i think it's, it's bold in our culture to go with this but you are beautiful as terzar my darling as lovely as jerusalem as majestic as troops with banners that does not sound wooey to me particularly here's two different cities and this is what you remind me of terza particularly was a city in samaria and its name means favored And for a long time, it was the capital of the Northern Kingdom. Um, And archaeologists suspect that it it was this place that had its own water supply, and it had these really impressive gardens, and it was known for being really fruitful. And then he, he compares it to Jerusalem, the capital, which was even more impressive. And I just wonder whether, because it's these two places that are mentioned, he's not just singing of... I once went to this really amazing place. You remind me of Barcelona. You know, I've I've had some happy times in Barcelona. You really remind me of this kind of really beautiful city. It's It's not just that. 
but it's a picture of beauty around unity between these two kingdoms who have kind of wandered from each other, got separated at various points, opposed each other even, but now they're united with this king who calls them his own. And he's right there in the city. The troops and the banners means that he's, he's present. The king is in residence. So this, if this is Jesus singing about his church, some sense of unity, these different places, but places where the king dwells. I just wonder whether this is, this is about Jesus loving the unity of his church. I think, we, I, think, I think it's an image we come back to again. So again, we, so he moves on. He says, turn your eyes from me. They overwhelm me. This is an expression of God. It's, it's, not, it's not Jesus saying, stop looking at me so much, but it's artistic, expressionistic to, to, to describe how much he loves his people. And then you get the next bit of the description. Your, your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Again, bold move, comparing someone you love to a goat, um, but, but that's it. And, and the, the reason I think, again, this is significant, is the route down from Gilead took you down. This, it was this kind of long flowing, or is, this long flowing mountainside down to the Sea of Galilee. And the, at that point, the, the valley raises a really, really long way. It's like a, a mile up onto the plateau where where Gilead was. And if you looked out over from, from the bottom, along the top and around, and it's just miles and miles of this kind of valley moving down. And I think what you'd see, what he's talking about is, if you looked at it, you'd see these lines of black goats weaving their way down the mountainside. And it's not, it's not steep. You can walk down it. It's a, it's a nice smooth valley and you can walk all the way down to the sea. And uh, it's right at the northern point of the kingdom, you know. So I think it's it's like the top of the thing. You see the, the the you know the these these kind of goats walk down. Now, on one level, okay, it's just a celebration of of beauty, but there's a whole sense of I wonder the the beauty of not just the whole, but made up of these individual parts, these long lines that are made up of the, of the goats, but they're all moving in the same direction, the same speed. I wonder whether it's kind of quite a countercultural image of beauty. Unity almost feels impossible in our culture. We don't really celebrate it. We celebrate individuality over, over collectivism. We'd look at a mountainside of, of goats and see all the goats sprawled out, all doing its own thing. You know, one's eating a shoe, one's um, sniffing another goat where you shouldn't sniff a goat. Uh, another is seeing if it can skydive off a rock. Another one is kind of... Um, uh, you know, tr trying to chew something that's, you know, just going to infect its mouth and all the rest. And we'd be there looking at it thinking, oh, what a celebration of individuality if these goats are going their own way. But of course, their context was dangerous. Goats get stuck in ravines. Goats get eaten by wolves. Goats can't find water. So the idea of seeing all of these goats walking down in lines, all led by shepherds, is, I wonder whether it's just this, this image of this, this is a beautiful thing. And again, for the church, the idea of each one of us following Christ, sticking close to him and to one another, walking alongside each other. I wonder whether that's part of the image that's being celebrated here. Or the next part of the image is in verse 6. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the wash. I mean, that is brave, isn't it? Your teeth remind me of a sheep dip. That's bold imagery, isn't it? Each has his twin. Not one of them is missing. And on one level, okay, it's just a husband celebrating his wife. And we forget because we sort of, I don't know whether, we're just so used to everyone on TV now has perfect teeth, don't they? But at the time when this was written, there was minimal dentistry going on in Israel. People would have teeth that were rotten or broken or ending up in all sorts of different directions. So this beautiful woman whose teeth were whiter than white and all in the right place and all pointing in the right direction was actually just a thing of beauty. It was just kind of marked her out, striking. I think if you had perfect teeth, people would sort of stare at you a little bit and think, oh, wow, look at them. 
But again, on a different level, what is God singing over his church? Celebrating perfection and unity. None is missing. I think a sense that the church really stands out with perfection and unity. What makes her desirable and different and strange? This is what Jesus finds beautiful about his people, that we're different, but we, we're together. Or verse 7, your, your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Apparently, this was quite the compliment at the time. It was kind of commonly known that you would compare someone's face to pomegranates. It was a way of kind of praising how rosy their cheeks are, but also the pomegranate was an aphrodisiac, so it was full of seeds. It was seen as kind of bountiful and, and productive. And then you have these peculiar verses in, in 8 and 9. Sixty queens there may be, and eighty concubines, and virgins beyond number, but my dove, my perfect one, is unique. The only daughter of her mother, the only, the favorite of the one who bore her, the young woman see her and call her blessed. The queens and concubines praise her. And some, of, some people have used this verse to say, oh, this is, Song of Songs is just written as an explanation of how wrong Solomon is, that he, he loves women. And you have this imagery of the court here, of the king surrounded by women, wives and concubines. Solomon had a court of a thousand women. It's kind of a horrific image of abuse of power by a king. It's exactly what God warned would happen if you have a human king, he says. But in contrast to all of that, it's the, it, the man is saying, of all these women, I have eyes only for you. And I guess we'd look on all this imagery and think, well, what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying to us through this? And I think it is just a celebration of the unity of the church that he finds beautiful. What do you think Jesus would would say if he was physically wandering through the church today. I think we'd expect him to have some favorites, wouldn't we? If Jesus kind of wandered through and, and stopped and spoke to different people, what would you think he'd say? Do you think he would just be like Revelation 2 and 3, those letters to the churches? This is what you're doing well, but this is what you're doing really badly. He kind of come to the front of Grace Church and say, this is what you're doing well, this is what you need to work on. But what if Jesus addressed his church and said, this is what I love about the church. This is what I love about this church. And he just went round name by name by name through everyone saying, this is what you mean to me. This is what I find lovely. Went through the different elements of grace church, praising person by person. And then spoke about how he loved the unity and the wholeness and the harmony of God's people. And then what what would happen if he then went, not just from this church, but then to another church, praising person after person, then speaking about how collectively they are precious as his body, reaching the city together. And then speaking about how we're connected together as a, as a national church and then connected as a global church and then connected as an historical church to every Christian. In the language of chapter four, in this kind of related list, he says, you've stolen my heart. Saying the church is the thing I most love in all the world. And if he said that, would you, why not, would I believe it? And I think that's why Song of Songs is here. I think that's what God, this is what God sings over his people. Not that we're like cheeks of pomegranate and things like we get lost in the imagery. But every part having its place. Finding the beauty and seeing the beauty of what it means. I just wonder whether this, this is the stuff that really challenges us. Can I give you three kind of things that might just, this speaks into? Firstly, just a sense of how Jesus feels about his church. If this book, if it speaks beyond just one couple and is an expression of God's people, I hope it helps you know how much you are loved by God. If you're sat here and just thinking, I just... I know that's true of other people. I just don't believe it's true of me. 
because you feel guilty or ashamed or worthless. And you think, well, I'm sure Jesus does love some people, but he loves everyone else more than he would love me. Or maybe if you look at other churches and say, oh yeah, Jesus really loves the church you know, in China or India or down the road, or, but not us. I hope you listen to the words of a love song for his church and just celebrate how much we are loved by God. God is not stingy with his love. He is lavish. He is a lavish lover of his church. He pours out love for his people. And secondly, on, the, on this final imagery of these final verses here, the thing we're supposed to see that Jesus is jealous for his church. He has eyes just for us. He doesn't want us to respond with rationality to say, oh, I know I should overlook these other gods, these other idols. But, but rather we just be overwhelmed by a sense of God's love for us with such a kind of focus that it's not difficult to look beyond other gods or, or the idols or the things that we use in life other than God and just be overwhelmed by a sense of God's love for us. We act not just because it's in our best interest rationally, but because we know he is the one who truly loves us. And then thirdly, I wonder if the third thing just speaks to us from this. If it's the harmony of the church that's being celebrated in lots of the imagery here, then we can understand why across the whole of the New Testament, this kind of fragile unity of the church is so precious and is spoken about so often. And maybe we're just kind of called back to think we are, we are not to undermine our unity together. It is something fragile that is worth protecting. We are not to just kind of think ill of each other. We are not just to act out of self-interest. We are not just to place all our own preferences and expectations at the center. We are not just to make church all about us. It should grieve us if the church isn't diverse. It should grieve us when the church doesn't love well or is driven by racism or sorts of things. It's the thing that Jesus celebrates is the harmony of his people. This is the thing that causes Jesus to celebrate and delight in his people. I'm not saying, listen, we need to be united and experience harmony together to kind of woo Jesus back to us. Of course not. He saved us by his blood precisely because we weren't all of those things. We can't attract Jesus to us by doing that. It's, it's the reverse. Maybe it just reframes all of these things to say, Jesus has given us a beauty that is ours, a unity, a breadth, a depth. Why would we sacrifice our beauty for dirt? Why would we abandon the very thing that makes us precious and delightful to God? Why would we turn our back on the thing that Jesus sings over his people? Why don't I pray and pray, maybe pray those verses from Ephesians 3, just that we would know and experience the depth of Jesus' love for us and it would refresh us and refu- re- and refresh us and renew us now in this particular moment. Let me pray. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with inner power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer for one another right now. 
that we might know through the Song of Songs to know the width, the length, the height, the depth of your love for us. And not just to know it in our heads on some rational, analytical level, but to believe it and treasure it in our hearts. To know that there is a song that you sing over us, that you are singing over us today. And that we would believe it, Lord. We pray, particularly for those of us who may just feel far from you. Or maybe we just feel a sense of constant, unrelenting distance of having lost sight of the depth of your love for us today. Lord, we pray, bring it back. Refresh us, renew us. Help us to feel something of your love and mercy, of your face turned towards us, shining upon us. That you see us as something beautiful because you have made us beautiful. That that you have died in our place in order to win us back to yourself, in order that we might know the depth of your love for us. Lord, we plead with you now not to let us go until we know something of your love for us and experience that and help us to respond to you that we might love you too and not be shy in telling you how we feel towards you. So Lord, we pray, awaken something within us, stir within us sense of love for you as we respond to your love for us, we pray. Amen.